How did an expatriate, eccentric Englishman become the grandfather of gay porn? Peter de Rome, whose erotic films were made at a time when doing so was incredibly dangerous, would later gain recognition in the 1970s with Jack DeVoe, and then some 40 years later with a different generation. The story behind Peter de Rome's The Destroying Angel came to be when de Rome noticed that by the mid 70s, many subjects were tackled by the gay erotic film except horror. At the same time, de Rome wanted to make a film that had been lingering in his mind about twins. What de Rome ended up making was a psychosexual horror film that bends and blends so many genres. Can I help you with something? Yeah, I'm looking for Levi. Okay, right over there. I need something tight. Will Seegers appeared in some of the most iconic gay porn films of all time, working with other talented models and filmmakers. He was a stunning man. Having come into his looks in his mid-twenties, he became the quintessential 1970s man everyone lusted over. In this episode, we're going to celebrate Peter Derome, a charming Englishman and cinematic outlaw who channeled his erotic side and experimented with putting his unique vision on celluloid, by doing so contributing to some of the best gay erotic films in the industry's history. We'll also review Derome's The Destroying Angel, a haunting, psychedelic gay erotic film that explores twin cess, religion, the ego, and magic mushrooms, of course. And last but not least, we will celebrate Will Seegers, who starred in a string of classic scenes during his cinematic run in the late 1970s and early 1980s. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you that you can help this channel and its original yet risque content by liking, clicking the subscribe button, or selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. And for all you podcast listeners, leave a review or rate it if you can. Thank you. Peter de Rome was born in joie les pans Côte d'Azur, France and was raised in the southern part of England. At an early age, de Rome developed a fascination with movies, often going as far as skipping school and watching two to three movies at a time. De Rome also mentions having grown up with National Geographic magazines in the house and always being drawn to darker and indigenous men. Also around this time, de Rome volunteered for the Royal Air Force and served in France, Belgium, and Germany. When he returned to civilian life, Derome flirted with the idea of becoming an actor. He then found himself in the British film industry. His first job was as a publicist working on such films like The Third Man by David O. Selznick. Derome left post-war England in 1956 when Selznick offered him a job on his upcoming film A Farewell to Arms. When he arrived in New York, the film had a hard time getting off the ground, and Derome got a job at Tiffany's. Derome was working at Tiffany's. At the time, a little film called Breakfast at Tiffany's, starring Audrey Hepburn and George Pappard, was being made. Derome then left Tiffany's and went down south and spent two years of his life working in the civil rights movement, calling the experience the most meaningful and best part of his life. Derome and his actor friend, Madeline Sherwood, went down to Alabama and demonstrated on behalf of members of the movement who had been thrown in jail. During this time, Derome bought a video camera to use during the demonstrations. After his involvement with the civil rights movement, Derome came home and began to use his video camera to film naked men, both himself and others, and made short 8mm films. Before long, he was experimenting with film and working in little bits of nudity, seeing what he can get through the film developers. At that time, film developers were within their rights to destroy anything they deemed obscene. He began to look back at the films he loved for inspiration, but was also inspired by the new post-war filmmakers and visual realism. He was also very inspired by Un Chant de Amor by Jean Genet. Jerome's first official film, according to him, was called Butch Easter, in which he claims to have started shooting in Central Park when a handsome black man got in his shot and Jerome followed him around town and finally invited him to his home. The two men then fooled around. Jerome began making erotic films 
sometimes of his very own erotic encounters and showed them privately at parties to friends and acquaintances. Word of their unusual content spread until invitations to a showing of Dorome's films in Paris, London, and New York became the hottest underground ticket in town, with international celebrities vying with each other for a screening. Then Dorome began to get distributor interest, and in 1973, Dorome's program, The Erotic Films of Peter Dorome, opened in New York City to glowing reviews. Jerome painstakingly crafted and originally made films for the amusement of friends who urged him to have them blown up and made commercially available. His 30 or so gay short films are an amalgamation of bits and pieces of his life and tangents he's gone off on. One of the things of note is Jerome is one of the only directors of this period who fully explored black eroticism. Jerome made a conscious effort to have several black men in every film he made. Many of his films were shot in various locations from Paris to London to Malaga to New York City. Interweaving images of magical places gave warmth to the chasing and the cruising, filled with psychological excitement of threat and horniness. His short film Double Exposure is surreal, simple and erotic, showcasing Jerome's delicate balance between the dance of the camera work and the editing. Hot Pants is simple and precise, a skill that is very underrated. Jerome's short film Second Coming, shot predominantly in Malaga, centers on the quest for a statue of the crucified Christ that has the miraculous ability to get an erection and ejaculate. Daydreams from a crosstown bus centers around the sexual fantasies of a young man as he rides the bus and is shot in a stream of consciousness that reveals the obsessive and arbitrary nature of sexual fetishizing. Mumbo Jumbo is a satire on the slogan crazed world of advertising while intersplicing images of nude men revealing the homosexual subtext of much of Madison Avenue. Green Thoughts is a satire on the back to nature and save the environment movements of the 1970s. Underground is about a blowjob on the subway. It captures the reality of what goes into a public hookup without getting caught. The title of the film referring not only to the subway but an entire way of life that is buried under the veneer of civilization. It became one of Dorome's most notable short films. Prometheus is a compelling exploration of bondage on film. The allegorical story of a Greek hero chained to a rock as punishment for giving mankind the gift of fire. Combining classic mythology with contemporary sexual practices, revealing the archetypal timelessness of both. Fire Island Kids encounters all very important yet different experiences to the people they inspired. The film that Peter Dorome is probably best known for is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is a full-length feature, Dorome's first produced by Hand in Hand Films. This is Peter Dorome and uh, we've been just looking at the trailer, uh, the coming attractions for Peter's new film Adam and Eve. Peter shot uh, this past summer in France. We shot in various places, the Pape Saint-Cloud and the uh, chapel in the country where Jean Cocteau is buried. And we also went to Père Lachaise where Oscar Wilde is buried. And most of these places we weren't allowed to film in. And we were always getting harassed by the police, but we used to sneak in with the cameras and little bags and things. Actually, the uh the uh, difficulty which we anticipated was the uh, easiest part, which was getting the actors and the film and uh, to France and back into the country. In fact, when uh, we brought the film back into the United States, the customs inspectors thought, because of the uh, markings on the cans, that we had uh, made a vacation film. It is an erotic game in five sequences, a story about an American tourist and Eve. The men have a brief affair but a long-lasting relationship is prevented by Eve's insistence that they not share personal information. It also stars adult film icon Bill Eld as a narcissist and is technically known as the final film appearance for actress Greta Garbo. I'll tell you more about that later. Lastly, it was also one of the first times there was an all-black orgy in a gay porn film. Adam and Eve screened at film festivals across the U.S. and Canada and made the Roam a name synonymous with quality hardcore cinema. Peter de Rome is the grandfather of gay porn, or as he would have it, the granddaddy of gay porn, an auteur who started making movies when it was incredibly illegal. 
stopped making his own films in the 1980s when AIDS was taking its toll on the gay community. Derome was content with going back to his day job as a publicist for Paramount Pictures and enjoying his life. When Derome's work was rediscovered in the early part of the 21st century, audiences were already used to hardcore gay erotica as the norm. Derome's work could be seen by steady consumers as lacking fireworks, where penetration took a backseat to thematic and stylistic decisions. However, there is a mystique attached to the name Peter Derome. Much of it is simply based on a viewer's particular taste and how well Derome chooses to satisfy them or not satisfy them. Here I am in St. Augustine's Cemetery in Ramsgate. But my family plot is right behind me. They're only waiting for me to join them, and that'll be the end of the Jeromes in England. <laughs> it's a very nice, quiet little place. Peter Dorome passed away at his home in Kent on June 21st, 2014, just shy of his 90th birthday. Before his passing, Jerome had the privilege of having his work archived at the British Film Institute and remains one of the only gay erotic filmmakers to hold that prestige. There is also a brilliant documentary by Ethan Reed called Peter Jerome, Grandfather of Gay Porn that was made in 2014. Fun Fact Peter Jerome moved to New York City and lived in his cushy and cozy apartment for 20 years in a plush neighborhood thanks to rent control. Jerome lived just around the corner from film legend Greta Garbo. While shooting Adam and Eve, Garbo was out for a walk and Jerome filmed her walking across First Avenue. The footage was inserted into Adam and Eve and its presence was explained by having Adam recalling how he once saw the elusive star. The footage was used without Garbo's knowledge or permission and she was never paid for her appearance. By chance, Peter de Rome read John Allegro's The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross that seeks to equate Jesus Christ with a mushroom, the Amanita Muscaria. Intrigued by this idea, de Rome then read R.G. Wasson's Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, which traces the same mushroom of the Soma plant in the ancient Rig Veda of India. With his inspiration in check, de Rome sat down at his typewriter and began writing. He looked up and saw his painting of Edgar Allan Poe above him as a sign. The Destroying Angel is based on a short story by Edgar Allan Poe called William Wilson. The film focuses on Caswell Campbell, played by Tim Kent. Caswell is a young man of the cloth, a man of God torn between his religion and his sexual urges. He takes a three-month sabbatical and dives deep into his own sexual journeys with the help of a Soma mushroom. The film is set in mid-1960s New York City and opens at a bar where a man played by Big Bill Eld orders a bud, whose name also happens to be Bud. Budweiser, please. Bud? That's my name. No kidding. We then meet Caswell, who stands next to Bud and eavesdrops on the interaction. Bud then drops some proverbial knowledge on Caswell, which convinces him to bring him home. Well, I guess there's only one way to satisfy curiosity. What's that? By finding out. Just like there's only one way to overcome temptation. What's that? By giving in to it. While waiting outside, Caswell sees a naked man in the window. Upon a closer look, he realizes it's himself. Bud walks into Caswell's place and is put off by a crucifix. Caswell then sees his alter ego again in the mirror, holding a Soma mushroom. Now when you watch the film, you will notice that the first sex scene between Tim Kent and Bill Eld is sex, but not so erotic. Something that is openly alluded to by Eld's character. Don't you think you kind of got me here on false pretenses? What do you mean? Well, I thought you had a great deal more to offer. This was actually done on purpose by Jerome. He wanted to portray the reality that not every sexual encounter is a great sexual encounter. 
It also adds to the torment the main character is going through. After the sex scene, through voiceover, we learn that Caswell is on a three-month sabbatical from his priestly studies and questioning his devotion and faith. He receives a phone call from a friend inviting him to a dinner party. His friend also tells him he invited a friend named Grant who was asking about Caswell. After the phone call, Caswell partakes in a soma mushroom and has a crazy trip that leads to one of the most infamous scenes in early gay erotica. Caswell is on the ground and surrounded by anonymous men in denim jeans who begin to urinate on him before ejaculating all over his body. At the dinner party, Caswell arrives and almost immediately hears a voice calling to him. Caswell. Caswell Campbell. What was that? What was what? We then meet Grant, who has been asking about Caswell. They leave the party early, as do the other guests, leaving the host alone. Back at Caswell's place, Grant partakes in a Soma mushroom and the two have sex. Here's where it gets really trippy. Grant climbs in bed and through clever shots, he's having sex simultaneously with Caswell and his alter ego. The experience proves too much for Caswell and he tells Grant he has to go away for a while. Cut to the beach, a deserted beach. This is where he had to go away for a while, of all places. While walking on the beach alone, he comes across a man laying naked in the sand. A boy in the sand, if you will. While back home shaving, he is confronted by his alter ego who lets Caswell know he can help him or destroy him. He tells Caswell where he can find more Soma mushrooms. After finding them, he heads back to the beach and brings home the man he encountered earlier. They both eat the Soma mushroom and have sex with everything in the kitchen. A zucchini, I think I saw a banana in there even a baseball bat at some point. At the end of the sex scene, we see a pale and disheveled Caswell grabbing a book from his fireplace and reading that the Soma mushroom is deadly, destroying the kidneys, liver, leading to heart failure and death within a few days, thus fulfilling what Caswell's alter ego, the angel of life, had told him the other day. At the end of the film, Caswell stands above a fresh grave, falling onto it and masturbating to completion on what we come to learn is his own resting place. In my film, The Destroying Angel, which was my second feature-length film, I attempted to do what I call gay horror. I had several little things in my mind that I'd like to bring into the story. One was identical twins. Another one was the effect of hallucinogenic mushrooms. And um, the third one was, I don't really know, (laughs) I've forgotten. The Destroying Angel was written and directed by Peter DeRome. It was shot, crudely at times, by iconic filmmaker Jack DeVoe, and edited by his business partner, Robert Alvarez. This is like the porn trifecta of talent. Peter DeRome brings his storytelling, DeVoe his knack for the grandiose, and Alvarez's talent as an editor shines through the entire film. The music of the film, sometimes original, sometimes lifted from popular acts of the day, is so integral to the project, taking the visual to another level. So the infamous urination scene derives from the hypothesis that the sacred plant called the Soma in the Vedic culture was in fact a hallucinogenic mushroom with miraculous inebriating virtue enjoyed by the people of the Valley of Indus and the cattle they tended. The juice of the Soma had a similar intoxicating effect on the animals and is excreted still in its purest form in urine, only to be ingested once more by the peasants. No, I've never been interested in taking drugs myself. I'm, 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 I guess I'm interested, how could we not be, in you know, other people doing it and trying LSD and mushrooms and everything else. But uh, that never appealed to me. I like to be in control. Director Peter Jerome brings a balanced measure of storyline, emotion, and imaginative sex through artful photography to create this film. Now, I've watched a lot of gay porn. The Destroying Angel really stands out for how unique it is. It is a perfect example of artistry and its maker having complete autonomy over what they see in their mind and being allowed to create it undisturbed. If you want to watch The Destroying Angel, just like many of the classic films that I've reviewed on this show, it is available through Bijou Video. I will provide a link in the description of this episode so you can support them as they have the important task of keeping these videos available in their truest form.
Will Seegers was born in Jersey City, New Jersey in January of 1951. His early years were spent in northern New Jersey, and during his teen years, his family relocated to the Jersey Shore. Seegers attended parochial school for the first two years of his education, then he went to public school through high school. During his high school years, Seegers made a lifelong friend who was also gay. And though they didn't have a sexual relationship, their friendship attributed to both of these young men understanding their sexuality. Seegers would then go to college and study engineering and journalism, but reveals that his college career was mostly spent exploring his sexuality. Seegers lived in New Jersey during this time and would find himself taking the PATH train over to Christopher Street in New York City. It was there that Seegers was discovered by Man's Image Studios owner, Lou Thomas, who you may remember was Jim French's business partner at Cult Studios and would later start his own Target Studios. Seegers took a break from college and began to work as a flight attendant for Eastern Airlines. After two years, Seegers spent the beginning part of the 1970s traveling through the U.S. before moving to New York in 1974. There he posed for two straight photo shoots. Seegers spent some time in Arizona, where he bartended at a local disco. He would also work at a porn warehouse and get a behind-the-scenes look at the porn industry. In 1976, Seegers received a call from Lou Thomas, who asked him if he was interested in working on Fire Island in New York. Fire Island is and had been a popular gay destination. Seegers would make his way to Fire Island and worked at the Pines as a bartender, waiter, and lifeguard at the Blue Whale. Lou Thomas then asked Seegers to shoot a scene with Bruno. Shortly after his first video, Seegers would go right back to work, and he continued the schedule, shooting for studios like Cult, Man's Image, Bijou, and many more. In 1976, Seegers met Chuck Holmes, the owner of Falcon Studios. Holmes invited Seegers to San Francisco to work for him. Seegers accepted the offer and made his way to the West Coast. He would adopt two stage names, Will Seegers and Matt Harper. Yeah, I'm looking for the employment office. You're in luck. You're in a hurry. I know. Yeah, it's on the outside of the lot over there. See where the guy's coming out? Yeah, thanks. Seegers' years in San Francisco saw a good amount of studio work, including a scene with gay porn legend Al Parker. He would spend his time working for studios while holding full-time jobs as an audiovisual salesman and at San Francisco's first gay gym. Seegers really enjoyed lighting, sound, and music, and would hold many jobs during his career that would fuel his love and help him master his skills. Seegers would then make his way back to the East Coast to begin a new chapter of his life. Like many of the iconic stars featured in this show, Will Seegers graced the celluloid screen much to the viewer's pleasure and left a visual piece of himself at a time when erotic cinema was thriving with excitement and male representations that mirrored the time and age. A listener of the podcast messaged me and asked me to do a feature on Seegers. I do hope he enjoys this short piece if he sees it and wish him well. You've been watching Demons to Find Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demons to Find Gay Porn is available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Demons to Find Gay Porn is on X, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram. And if you like what you're watching or listening to and want to be a part of the creative process, head over to patreon.com backslash Demons to Find Gay Porn, where you can help support this audiovisual podcast and YouTube channel, and I can continue making content like you've just enjoyed. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Cheers. Cheers.